fellow planeswalkers. I'm James. And I'm Paul. And you're listening to the newest episode of the Commander at Arms podcast. This week on the podcast, we are talking about five very simple things that you can do to start leveling up your gameplay. But before we get into that, we have an upkeep trigger to do, and we're going to start here by thanking all of our patrons. Uh, You guys helped keep the lights on here in the studio, and I guess help. Paul and I stay fed because, I mean, we can't really, you know, do content without um, eating. So that's one thing. Uh, yeah, if you want to become a, a Patreon supporter, you can do that at patreon.com slash commander at arms. And, you know, that just goes uh, to, to, you know, help us bring more content to your eyes and your ears. Uh, after that, we have mail day. Paul, have you received anything interesting in the mail? I have, actually. So uh, I started a new job about a month ago. And last week, as a little bit of a celebration... Uh, also because I really want to get my cube done. I ordered some cards for my cube, including, including some shinies. Uh, so, for my mail day, I got two copies of the Japanese Mystical Archive uh, Faith Saluting uh, foil. Uh, I got a foil Ancestral Vision. That's for the cube. I got a Brain Freeze. That's not foil because that card is ridiculously expensive. Seriously, go look at it. Uh, and I got a foil Abbot of Carol Keep. Again, all for the cube. And I found about 15, maybe 16 cards in my collection for the cube as well. So getting ever so close to actually having this cube online. I know James is looking forward to it. I have a few other friends that are looking forward to it as well. So I really am keen to get that thing done. Yeah, I am just really excited to maybe like, you know, draft a Black Lotus or one of the mocks or something, something powerful. Uh, Maybe need to, you know, like... Like I said, you need to just have, make sure there's like some sort of documentation about like what the archetypes are in the cube. I know it's a power cube. It's a vintage power cube, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sick. That, it, man, I, I can't wait. I love powerful cards. Oh, they're so good. So good. Speaking of powerful <laughs> cards, I uh, I picked up some stuff in the mail uh, recently. I mean, I've ha- been getting a lot of cards shipped to me that aren't for me. They're for my, for my mate. Uh, so that I can put them all together and get them shipped internationally for him. Um, but uh, I think last time we talked, because it's been a while since we recorded an, an episode, uh, last time I had picked up the Mask of Gristle brand, because we were talking about the top 10 cards that we thought were going to be overlooked uh, in Midnight Hunt. And I picked up uh, Mask of Gristle brand in the foil, which was really, really sweet. Uh, I did just pick up a, a Fiend Hunter foil, uh, from, I think it was Eternal Masters for like 25 cents to a dollar. It was pretty dang good. And it's going to go in Taser. And then I picked up a Liliana's Spectre promo for my new Yarrick the Desecrated deck. And uh, I guess that's kind of a, an easy segue into um, the video for this week is go and check out Yarrick the Desecrated deck tech on YouTube. Uh, go and check out uh, the YouTube channel. It is Commander at Arms over there on YouTube. Uh, go and like, subscribe, comment, do all the things you need to do for the YouTube algorithm. Um, and yeah, go and check that one out. Uh, tell me in the comments what you think about the deck. Uh, I love it. It's Saltai Engine, I guess, is what you want to call it. It wants to abuse ETBs as much as possible. And uh, I'm going to leave all that for uh, later, James, to explain when he actually records the video, because this is coming out before then. So a little bit of a sneak peek there. Uh, And then after that, I want to uh, thank all the donators and the guests who made Memories Journey possible. Now, we did do that stream, uh, I believe it was last Saturday now. It was the 2nd of October. uh, And the results of that stream was, one, it was fantastically fun to play 15 hours of magic with some of your favorite content creators and my favorite content creators and be able to raise money for a charity. And that was Alzheimer's. Uh, we raised four thousand two hundred and six dollars and ninety cents uh, in fifteen hours, and that was fantastic. So again, uh, I've said it on Twitter, I've said it on Instagram and everywhere, but I'm now saying it here. And I just want to thank everyone who donated, everyone who watched, and all of the guests. Are uh, thinking, you know, Sheldon Menery, Ashlyn Rose, Gavin Verhey, Play to Win, Playing with Power, Mind Sculptors, uh, Toma, and. Uh, Mitch from Commander's Quarters, Vincent, uh, sorry, Vince, Pleasant Kenobi. Uh, yeah, you guys are awesome. And yeah, just thanks to everyone because that was such a fun, fun day of magic. And then next after that, we have our play of the week. Paul, I know you've been a little bit busy with, uh, you know, real life stuff, but have you managed to play any games of magic this week? Um, This week, I believe I played on Sunday, actually. Right? What is what is this week? What is today? 
Today's Saturday. Today is Saturday. It is the 9th. That's probably going to date when we record this episode, but whatever. A little behind the scenes for you. Um, so, yes, actually, I did just play this past Sunday. Uh, and honestly, I've been on a real kick of playing other people's decks lately. Um, by the way, if you're ever looking for a way to spice up your commander night, just don't play your decks. Seriously. <laughs> a- ask a friend if you can borrow one of their decks. Guarantee you, you'll have a ton of fun. Especially if you've never played that deck before. I do it all the time. Um, so I've, I actually played, uh, I played Alex's Urza deck and we were actually playing a five person game of Sheriff. And let me tell you, I've never felt so at home than I did at that moment playing that Urza deck. I had static orb online on like turn, what was it? Like three or four. I had a turn two Emery, uh, I had Urza on curve, and I was swinging with like two nine nine or ten tens by like turn six or so. It was great. I loved it. I loved every second of it. <laughs> I think Alex and I didn't need to have a talk about that deck because <laughs> <laughs> that's monstrous, dude. That's that's a that's a little how you going. It was a I'm good hand. Lie. I will not lie. It was a good hand. It was a very good hand. It was like the hand I had today. Uh, so I managed to uh, get up a little early this morning uh, before we recorded this episode and play some Magic with my mates back home. And I played Taysa Karlov the first game and I got stomped because I had a very slow hand. Uh, and then I played Taysa Karlov the second game and I went Swamp, Sol Ring, Signet, Lantax, Pass. Lantax sucks. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Because as soon as I said it, I was like, yeah, Paul hates this card. Everyone's like, but why? I'm like, it's deck thinning. It's so good. But I was going first. And I was like, this is a dead card unless, like, someone else plays, like, you know, something that's going to help them. And uh, lo and behold, the person in third who was playing the only, the only other person who was playing, oh, the only other person who was playing green was him. Because it was a Mizzix deck, a first sliver deck, and an NG Falcon Wrath deck, and Taser. Uh, the first sliver deck decided he was going to ramp. And ever since then, it was like, all right, cool. Every turn I get my land tax trigger. And I was very happy. I was just thinning out my deck so that when I was drawing cards, I was drawing nothing but gas and just kept going through my deck. And I guess that's not really the way to rate uh, a land tax because, I mean, you know, that's pretty much all it realistically does is lets you just, like, you know, take the basics out of your deck and throw them in the library. Uh, sorry, throw them in the graveyard. Um, and I have set that deck up to where I only really need six, six mana and I can cast literally everything in my deck. So once I'm at six, I'm good, but I'm only casting one thing per turn and not really doing much after that. Everything else that I produce after that is just absolute gravy. You know, I have like sack outlets that produce mana. Uh, so like Ashnod's altar and stuff. And I have, um, Pilfel's plunder that whenever I sack creatures, I get, you know, treasures and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's all just, it's all good. It's fantastic. Land tax. Still a mediocrely okay card, but way too expensive for what it should be. And uh, that's not even my my play of the week, Paul. My play of the week was when I was playing Yarrick. Uh, I got to do a really cool play. Um, We got board wiped. We got uh, the new board wipe, actually, from Midnight Hunt. Uh, Extinguish the Horde. So destroyed all creatures. Um, Because I I think that's the one that does... I think it deals 13 damage to all creatures, right? But it's in white. It's like a Blasphemous Act, but in white and double white. I can't remember um, the name of it, but yeah, it, it's it's yeah. just it's not thirteen damage, but it's it's just destroy all creatures and then it yeah, gets okay. reduced. Yeah, it is. It's vanquish the horde because it was translated to something else. It was like abolish the horde or something. Um, but yeah, that happened. And then the next turn, I had enough mana to recast Yarrick, and then because I had treasures, so I was able to recast Yarrick with seven treasures and then tap seven mana and play a Sepulchral Primordial, and. The funny thing about that was the guy who actually, uh, who, who board wiped, shout out to my mate Jared, um, he left his commander in the graveyard because he wanted to, he wanted to use Patriarch's bidding to get it back out again with everything else back out again on the next turn. And I went Sepulchral Primordial. I got, uh, I was actually, I was playing with Corey because I got Corey's um, wall of, uh, sorry, Crashing Drawbridge, the haste wall. I got Harmonic prodigy and murmuring mystic off the storm player and then i got jarena kudro and thalia a guardian of thraben out of uh the human mardu stacks players deck which was my mate jared so then it got to etb and yarrick got to double that etb so i got two 
one month soldiers out of it. And then I went from having like no board state to a massive board state. And everyone's like, holy wow. And I was like, yeah, Sepulchral Primordial is such a good card in that deck. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that, um, so if you've already watched the video, I, I, I think James, we have two versions of that deck. Uh, James has one that's a little bit on the higher side. And then uh, James is like, Paul, what can I do to like tune this down a little bit? Because I have people telling me it's high. So then I, t I just took it. I reworked it a bit. And one of the cards that I put in there was Sepulchral Primordial. And literally, the exact words I said to James is pretty much what he just said, is that with Yarok on the field or even without Yarok, this card will go from 0 to 100 real quick. And yeah. that is literally exactly the situation that James described. Yeah, and then next turn I was able to play uh, Tharsa Deep Dwelling and just flicker it, and I just got everyone's graveyard. So I was like, it was <laughs> one. And, and the funny thing is, is I ended up losing that game too. I managed just to stall out and couldn't do anything, and they were able to get back up again. So just James yeah. things, <clears throat> just classic James things. Doing you know zero to a hundred in ten seconds, or not even ten seconds, in like two seconds, and then just dying to someone who swings. And yeah, it's bad. Anyway, uh, we've spent like ten minutes on this podcast, and we haven't even uh, gotten to the main meat and potatoes of the of the episode yet. We could keep going and talking about Yarrick and like everything else we've done in the last two weeks because it has been quite a while since we've we've got to talk to the lovelies and everything um but it we are been. here but we are here to uh talk about the five very very simple things that you can do to start leveling up your gameplay and this was actually paul's suggestion i was talking to him what was it yesterday day before that i was like man we, need, we, we really need a topic what's something we can talk about and he's like bam there's your five things off you go so uh He's going to helm this episode a little bit, and I'm just going to kind of support him. I'm going to be his companion. I'm going to be his uh, his Lutri, even though I'm banned, apparently. Uh, so, we, uh, like I said, we're going to move into main phase one here, and we're going to do the first one. And that one is, I guess, is just take your time with magic. And I'll, I'll get Paul to kind of explain what he meant by take your time. Yeah, and before I even talk about that, I just want to say, obviously, me and James are not, like, pro players or anything. Uh, but these are just some things that I have done personally that even though they sound super redundant and like super obvious, these are things that people actually don't do a lot of the time because, I don't know, various reasons. But most of the time, maybe they feel like pressured to uh, play the game a certain way. And honestly, if you find yourself making a, mis like making a lot of mistakes that you know that you wouldn't have otherwise, uh, these are just some quick tips that might help you in the long run just kind of up your game just like maybe one percent at a time uh just to you know get all your ducks in a row so to speak so like james said first of all most importantly take your time uh i've seen a lot of people make really simple mistakes just because they're rushing through their turn um obviously there are various reasons why you would want to do that um, when you're playing with friends, it's a little less serious because your friends are just going to be like, oh, yeah, like just take that back, whatever. Uh, not a big deal. But when you're playing out in the wild, uh, as sad as it is to say, people might not be so understanding. And you kind of have to depend on yourself to make sure that you are addressing each situation correctly. You know, like even in like an aggro deck, you know, make sure that you are instead of taking five seconds to just like tap a red mana and play your one drop, <clears throat> th really think about the line that you're taking. Try to think about what's in your deck. Think about the land that you play. And honestly, over time, these decisions will come to you much more naturally than having to actually think about it. And then at that point, you can start going a little bit faster. But it's really important, especially if you're just starting the game. And even if you've been playing for years, this might be something that you're, you're not doing. Really think about even just the land that you play. I saw a video one time of Reed Duke. Granted, he was playing modern. This was a long time ago. He took about three minutes playing... Actually, he was playing Elves and Legacy to think about playing a Bayou versus playing a Basic Forest. That's... that that Like, that... Obviously, maybe not that drastic, but it is a great example of how such a seemingly minor decision can affect the rest of the game for you. And so... As tip number one, just take your time. Think about everything that you're doing. So did he ever explain why he was uh, taking that time to 
you know, drop a bayou over a basic forest? Was like he needing the black pip or something and then just wasn't sure if he had enough or? I honestly, I can't remember. This video was like maybe seven years ago, I think. So it's been quite a while. Uh, I think the argument was for like uh, whatever that green black elf is that each opponent loses life equals number of elves you control. Uh, I think it was an argument for like doing that on turn two or three or whatever versus getting wastelanded or something like that. I can't remember. Ah, uh, that's fair. Yeah, I can see why that. And I mean, like that—that's pro play. That's not like anything. That's not like casually, you know, ma- uh, Friday night magic or like Friday night uh, uh, commander or anything. Um, which we usually allowed, you know, we kind of allow takes backsies. And I mean, I, I guess like the, take the, uh, you know, the, the, the take backsie counters things or whatever, whatever that has now been coined from, uh, from the, I hate your deck guys, um, as a thing that's now become a house rule against all, I guess like not all commander decks, but you know, the large majority of commander players now, um, you know, if you're there for fun take it back you know kind of thing uh and then if you're not there for fun you're there for for competitive magic or like you're playing in a higher pod where you are literally trying to play to win yeah just slowing down taking your time making sure that you're kind of thinking not just about the turn you're playing now but what you're playing into and then kind of evaluating the board state just before your turn and looking at your cards and kind of thinking like all right cool if I do X, Y, Z, then this is going to happen or this changed throughout that. So it's going to change your strategy a little bit and kind of just like, I'm going to piggyback on that and say like, not only take your time, but kind of, you know, think about what's going to be doing, what you're going to be doing on your turn before it gets to your turn. So that way you kind of have an idea of like, Hey, you want to be, how you want to play. You can kind of use the downtime while someone else is playing to, uh, to kind of think of your strategy and your lines of play. And then if anything changes, you can just change the way that you think about it. All right, cool. Like I can't play this now because it's no good because they have say an Elish Norn out and it's a one, one or a two, two. Okay. I can't play that now, but maybe I can do this instead to kind of like advance the board states for everyone else to help to get rid of the, the Elish Norn so that I can play it next turn. Takes me one turn off, but that's fine. Those kind of conversations I even have in my head to this day um i will sit there and when i'm playing taster i'll look at every single card i'll scan over them i know them quite well and i'm gonna use taster as an example because i literally just played three games in, uh, this morning with her um but she's a deck that i i pilot i think to a really high standard um because i know the deck really well and even i'll sit there and take time to kind of look at each card read the card again and go all right cool and then kind of think of my my plays and the way that I want to sequence things, because obviously sequencing things is very important as well. Yeah, and sequencing is one of those things that you you, you just kind of pick up on over time. Um, but I guess the last thing I just want to say about taking your time is I do it. And I, honestly, I haven't been playing Magic for as long as some people, but I've been playing it since 2012. I've been playing almost a decade. And you'll see me when I play Marisol, I sometimes take 10, 15 minutes on like turn two or three. Because there's 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 so many things going on in that deck, so many things I have to account for that, you know, every decision I make is extremely important. So, honestly, it is the first point that I brought up, but on, I would say that this is probably the most important one. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, moving on then, the next tip we have here is read your cards. Uh, not only reading them when you're kind of building the deck and building the strategy that you want to go but also reading the cards uh, that your opponents play and kind of making your plays uh, based on what they say. Uh, I have a really good example of this. It literally just happened this morning uh, in in my game with the first sliver uh, deck that I talked about in the um, uh, in the upkeep trigger. Now, uh, the Angie Falconrath player, uh, he played... A meal, a wheel of misfortune. I almost called it a meal of wis fortune. Uh, <laughs> good, good, good work, James. Uh, yeah, so he he played a, a wheel of misfortune, and instead of like actually reading the card, and that is one thing as well as like yes, we know all these cards, but sometimes a refresher doesn't really hurt. Um, instead of like reading the actual wording on the card, he kind of just explained how it worked. It was like you know, it's like the person who picks the lowest number of the uh, on like the lowest number doesn't wheel and doesn't take any damage anyone in the middle you know wheels and the person who picks the highest wheels and takes that amount of damage kind of thing and he was like oh okay like because it wasn't explained that way he just said oh you know like wheel of misfortune you get to choose if you wheel or not so he was like oh okay well then i'll just you know 
cast capsize and buy it back and do all this stuff. And then it was explained how the card actually works, like the way that it's worded. Uh, it is quite lengthy. Um, and he was like, oh, okay, well, in that case, because that's how it's worded, I don't just get to choose if I don't wheel, I actually have to make a choice. Um, and it's a chance I could wheel, I'm going to take that back and not do what he did. Um, so, I mean, yeah, not only is reading your own cards, but definitely also reading your opponent's cards is very, very important. It's almost just as important as reading your own cards. Yeah, and Wheel of Misfortune is a good example because that that is a very wordy card. Um, and there's kind of a lot to take in on that. Uh, but read any card. Even read Wheel of Fortune. And Wheel of Fortune is just each player draws seven or discards their hand and draws seven. And you can see even there, I just shortcutted it. And to a new player, it might not, not might not be very intuitive if I just say I'm going to wheel, you know. Um, but every card, um, I'm not saying that you're going to be reading Chains of Mephistopheles every time you read a card. But there are certain things on every card that you will miss if you don't read that card word for word. And I think it's especially important, and this kind of feeds into the taking your time thing, Uh I think it's especially important that every single card you play, you thoroughly read it and make sure it works the way that you think it does. Because I have seen people mess up combos and interactions because they just did not read a card from beginning to end. Happens all the time. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's something that you can do personally just to stop yourself from making a mistake. You know, just to save yourself the time later of finding out, oh, this doesn't actually do the thing that I thought it does. Uh... I uh, I need to take this out of the deck. I've done it before. I'm not sure if James has done it before, but I would guess yes. Yes, I definitely have. <laughs> I extremely have, yes. And there have been cards where I've gone, this is fantastic, and I've skipped over like one or two lines of text and gone, oh, it's actually bad. Like, it's not bad, but it's like, oh, I didn't realize that's the way that it worked, you know? Um, I actually... Uh, I used to play Blood Soaked Champion in Nairsil because I thought that the raid ability would work on Marisol when it's in the graveyard. But uh, Marisol has to actually be on the battlefield for its static ability to be applied. Um, yeah. So once I actually read Marisol on Gatherer, which, by the way, I'm just going to throw that in as like a tip 2.5. Uh, use Gatherer all the time if you're not sure about how something works. Chances are your question's already been answered. Um, Not only that, is oracle text is a thing. Like they, they, they've they changed wordings on, on old cards. Things that say like only target creature or player or whatever have been errata to say uh, any target now. So there mm -hmm. are some of those as well. So definitely gatherer is a fantastic tool to use when you're reading, I guess, older cards. Uh, and if you want to know also the rules on them. I mean, even newer cards. Like uh, Hostage Taker, that card was errata before it even came out. You know? uh, yes, it was. <laughs> um, so. not, o not only that, but like we've, we've, we've just had like all these keyword changes. Like mill is now a thing over saying, you know, target opponent puts the top two cards of the library uh, on into the graveyard. Now it just says mill two. Um, so that can be said instead of uh, like, if you want to, if you don't want to read the actual full card and it literally is just a mill card, uh, you say like, oh, this is mills too kind of thing. Like, yeah, all right, cool. We kind of all know what mill means. But if there is someone who doesn't know what mill means, just explain it to them and just be like, all right, cool. Well, you're going to take the top two cards of your library and you're going to put it in your graveyard. And that's it. And that's what milling means. You know, um, I actually got a really good opportunity to talk to Gavin uh, on stream uh, about like the uh, your opponents lose one and you gain one text and i was like hey can we change that to say drain one like i thought that'd be really cool and he's like well it's a little unintuitive and it's a little weirdly worded because like you're not really draining your you're draining your opponents you know you know like if it was anything that i kind of did it like you know to, to creatures you'd be like you know you can't drain creatures or whatever and i was like yeah okay like you obviously know more than i do about magic you've created how many sets now and i'm just a uh i'm just a podcaster who uh i'm just likes to what's up <laughs> i'm just a pleb you just call me a pleb wow i call All myself right. a pleb <laughs> yeah so i mean i did get to talk to gavin about that i was like please just call it drain because i i i shortcut it and i call it drain you know i just say oh these are my drain triggers because i mean it, it literally doesn't say you know your opponent you know it's either target opponent or your opponents lose one and you gain one so i was like yeah that's such an easy thing just to be like yeah drain one but um the there are keywords that, that are coming in and keywords that are coming out so like 
uh, if we talk about like surveil that came out in one set is now on uh, consider, but they don't call it surveil one. They call they just say like you know you get to scry one and then put it into the the bottom of your library or the graveyard, I believe. Well, surveil is not evergreen, which is the reason yes. why they can't do that. It's unique to the Demir Guild from Guilds of Ravnica, um, but. I'm definitely on board with making that one evergreen. It does take away from the identity of Demir in that set. And that, I guess it was a block because there were two sets. Yeah. It does take away from the identity of Demir from that set a little bit. Um, but it's such a good keyword to have at, in your, like in your, in your belt. It saves a lot of words. <laughs> yeah. And I will say like Gavin did do a video about it before the set came out. So just go check out that video on his, uh, his, his YouTube channel. Uh, I think it was something to do with surveil or consider uh, on Good Morning Magic. Uh, he does a lot better explanation about it, but it was pretty much just basically like because it kind of adds another thing to the vernacular of newer players because it is a standard set. They would have to know what surveil was pre that because it's the only card I believe in the set that actually does that kind of effect. So you would have surveil on one thing and then you would have to put reminder text and at that point you may as well just be typing out what just what surveil actually does outside of reminder text for me it's a little less intuitive that scry is never is evergreen and surveil is not i don't know because they're pretty similar i but, mean we'll get there eventually but anyway that's that's a whole different conversation to have um but it is a good conversation to return to later so paul what was your third tip uh this third tip is probably uh, I would say it's the second most difficult one out of all of these. Uh, actually, this four, the fourth one is what I would consider the hardest one. But uh, number three here is understand, accept, and learn from your losses. Uh, this one is very difficult because a lot of people tend to take losses kind of personally. Like They'll think that they're a bad deck builder. Uh, they'll think that they, quote, suck, end quote, at the game. Uh, especially if you're losing time after time after time after time after time. Um, I have gone on like 15, 20 loss streaks, and I I get that it's very easy to feel that way, especially when you're losing that many times in a row, but losses are important lessons, you know? Um, no matter how bad you lost or how close it was, there's always something to learn. Like, oh, I could have done X better. I could have done Y better. Uh, sometimes when I play with James, I'll even say out loud, like, oh, I misplayed. I, I should have played land X instead of land Y. I should have kept this card on the top instead of the bottom because I knew that you had this. Um, and it's important, honestly, after the game, after you lose, talk out the things that you did, you know? Maybe, some, maybe somebody else will have valuable insight into what you could have done. Um, and for me, at least, talking it out loud really helps me uh, realize that like, oh yeah, I definitely did screw up there. And you will become a much better player from just accepting a loss than doing anything else. Um, every time you lose, as long as you don't like take it to heart, there is something to take away from that game every single time. It doesn't matter if you lost the same way two games in a row. There is always something different to take away from that game. Yeah. I agree, because I've lost probably more than I've won. Uh, I've gone on huge losing streaks, actually, and I can even tell you the colors I lose in the most, uh, and that's Saltai. <laughs> it's just for some reason, Saltai just doesn't like me. When I was playing Maldrotha, every week we played at BAM together, I would lose. I maybe win like one game out of every 60 I played. Um... Whereas, like, now playing Yarrick, I have, again, I have lost. Every time I've played that deck, I have lost. And it's not because it's a bad deck. It's not because of anything else. I have gotten bad draws at one time or maybe two times. Um, I got no card draw at one time as well. So, I mean, it's all about, like, kind of figuring out that, that then, like, it kind of plays into the next point. So, I don't want to say too much about it on this point. But, um you know kind of just like if you're still learning the deck and you lose like don't think it's a bad deck because it's not it's just it had a bad time you know it had a bad game you know if you kind of see a, a pattern of maybe some cards that are dead in, uh, quote unquote dead draws or they're sitting in your hand for too long because they're kind of situational maybe think about like 
changing them out a little bit for something else. But uh, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get there on the next point. Um, I do evaluate almost every game that I play from almost start to finish in my head. Uh, we will usually have like pre-game, pre-game discussions. Sorry, not pre-game, post-game discussions, sorry. Well, we have pre-game and post-game discussions. Um, but in the post-game discussions, I kind of be like, oh, you know, like, oh, I had this in my hand or that in my hand or this in my hand, yada, yada, yada. I could have done this, I could have done that. Or like, be like, oh, if you hadn't done that on that, t- on, the, on that turn, I would have to have, you know, I could have gotten into this and then this and this. And I was not really seeing like that you're bad, but you're kind of understanding like what were the actions that were taken during the game that kind of got you to the point where you lost. And understanding that and kind of figuring out what happened, you can kind of cut, you can kind of start to see uh, a pattern of cards that then like, if you play against these people more often, you can then be like, all right, cool. I know what that card does now. I kind of know how to play around it, which will then kind of help you understand uh, your strategy and then kind of go from there. Uh, at least that's how I take away uh, take away from my losses. Uh, I kind of see like what my strategy was and was there any way that I could have changed it to possibly gotten a different outcome. But if not, I take the loss on, I shuffle up, we play again, we see where it goes. Yeah, and honestly, I think just as a closing note on this one, if you, while you're playing, can identify important junctures or like branching paths at certain points and after the game, go back and think like, oh, what would have happened if I took the other path? Those are also good things to consider, but I don't really have much else to say on that besides that. Uh, and neither do I. Uh, so with that, we're going to move to our combat phase now. Uh, and we're going to hear a message from our sponsors right now. Welcome back from that ad break. Uh, I hope you guys did all the damage that you were able to do in that combat phase uh and we're gonna move to our main phase two now where we're gonna play more of our spells this is where i'm gonna drop my land because uh that's how i play magic do everything mm, in the main you phase didn't play two. around days oh i didn't <laughs> <laughs> all right we got uh two last little tips tricks hints and uh i guess advice uh for you guys out there uh who are still here with us so the the next one that we're going to jump into here is uh, play the same deck over and over before moving on to other strategies. Uh, this is actually what I would consider the hardest one on here because I know it's very easy to get bored. Uh, you know, if you're playing like red deck wins, let's say you're playing Ragavan as your commander, right? And you're just playing a bunch of small dudes and a monkey. And, you play that over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It'll get boring quick. But playing the same deck repeatedly is an important way to make sure that you're developing skills with with one specific strategy. And instead of being, you know, like jack of all trades, master of none, you are probably not perfecting, but becoming very, very proficient with a certain style of deck. Then you have another deck. Like, like say you try like mid-range control. Uh, or mid-range value, sorry, uh, which is my preferred style. And this way you'll also get to really ensure that you have a favorite style. You know, if you don't give something a fair chance, you won't know if you like it or not. If you play it once and you're like, ah, I don't like it. Like, maybe it was just the wrong deck, you know? Maybe it was just the wrong commander. Um, Because there are so many different ways to build aggro you know we're in commander you can play one color aggro two color aggro three color aggro four color aggro you could play like five color humans aggro you know practically playing a modern deck in commander you could be playing five color aggro Najila. you could be doing that because i play uh, that <laughs> <laughs> i definitely play definitely that be doing that <laughs> um you know there's just there's so many different commanders and so many different ways to build each particular strategy that uh, i would say that playing one deck of a particular style a couple times is not enough for you to say whether or not you truly enjoy that gameplay style. Maybe it is, you know, maybe you're, you're just so sure that you don't enjoy it that you just never want anything to do with it ever again. But uh, when I first started playing Magic, I thought I loved uh, token making. Uh, well, sp- more specifically than token making, I thought that I really enjoyed uh, like aggressive token making decks you know like i in standard i played a deck that played like advent of the worm call of the conclave uh this was back in like 2012 2013 and 
I thought that that was the way to go for me. But the more and more I played, the more and more I realized that I, I actually just like getting value uh, while keeping tabs on the board, which is how I developed my love for you know more mid-range decks. Despite the fact that, ironically, my favorite deck is Mirasol, which is a control combo deck. Um, overall, I tend to favor more mid-rangey decks like Moldrotha and such. And I just think that if you're like building a deck after a deck after a deck after a deck, not that there's anything wrong with that, I would just recommend that you make sure you're playing each deck a fair enough number of times to really get, you know, get a hold on what you're doing with that deck. Yeah. I mean, I cannot agree any more with you on that one, Paul. Uh, I know that uh, I like creature-based strats. I like creature decks. Um, I like having a big board presence. Uh, I've tried playing like spell slinger decks like Calamax and stuff. And I mean, you guys have heard the, uh, the taking Calamax to the max. And if you haven't go check that one out, uh, we literally made it tokens because I wanted to have a big old board presence. And that's the way that I like to play magic. Um, if that be having lots of non-token creatures or lots of token creatures, I don't care. I just want to have lots of creatures on the field. I want to make sure my board, it looks stacked. You know what I mean? Um, so like I, I do favor towards strategies that, that lean heavily into that, um, you know, like a, a taste is an aristocrats deck that makes tokens that kind of abuse those tokens. Tulane plays, you know, creature spells, uh, gets card draw and ramp out of that as well. Uh, Najila goes infinite with, uh, combat steps requiring creatures to win the game. Um, Yarrick uh, abuses ETBs, uh, on creatures. So, I mean, I, basically if I play Yarrick, just sideboard in a, to a torpor orb and I lose on the spot. That's cool. I'm fine with that. Um, but I am kind of leaning between the two here, Paul, is I I think I build more decks than you do, like 100%. Um, because I think in the time that you and I have had this podcast, we've only, you've only actually built maybe like four or five new decks. Well, that's because I... I, I literally do this. Like, I like to play the deck over and over. Like, Vayron, I've played so many times over the past few weeks. Um, and, it's, again, it's really just so that I can make sure that the deck is at a point where I like it a lot and that I understand it before I move on to building something else, which, coincidentally, I, I actually am currently in a place where I kind of have an itch, you know, an itch that I need to scratch. Oh, I had that itch because Golos got banned and I, did, I needed to turn that Golos deck into something. So that's, I kind of got a forced itch by by the um, the Commander RC. So I had sleeves there. I needed to build a deck. I did a thing. Um, but Yarrick was always on my list of, of commanders to play. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've played, man, every deck that I own, I've played at least 60, 70 times. And I understand every deck not perfectly still um because obviously there are nuances and things that uh that that happen i mean like literally this today i found a new infinite combo in taste that i didn't even know was in there i didn't even think about it um but like pilfless plunderer twilight drover and a sack outlet was you know uh infinite mana infinite etbs and infinite uh ltbs so it's uh, enter the battlefield effects and leave the battlefield effects. So I went, oh, oh, okay. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because obviously Taser was on the field as well. So sack a spirit, <clears throat> get two colorless mana and two treasures, use the two colorless mana, sack a treasure for a white, remove a possible possible encounter, get two more spirits, keep going, do that infinitely. I eventually would have had enough uh spirits to then just start you know uh using the extra treasure to then draw my library out it was it was insane it was another way of just of going infinite that i never would have found if i didn't play taste of that uh t today um that now is a part of my repertoire i can now be like all right cool they're cards i want to look out for because i know that strategy because i have played this deck now 60 70 80 90 times you know it is my favorite deck it is my pet deck um so yeah I mean, just keep making sure you're hammering home on one strat until you love it, until you like the deck where it's at. And yeah, that one's kind of really hard to... It's really hard to explain it, isn't it, Paul? Like, what we're trying to, like, 
getting people to not really getting people to do, but I mean, there are decks that I, that I have that I don't play all that often and I don't really have the, not really the need to play them, but they come out every rare, ever, ever so like rarely that I kind of play them and I'm like, Oh, I don't know what actually needs to go in this deck or not. Um, like I have Obun, the mold I have ancestor, which I'm just, I'm flicking through my commanders right now. And I, that one, I haven't played as much as, uh, like a gear red in those colors. Uh, I play Old Nor Old Norbone a lot. Doretti I play a lot as well. Uh, Timner and Vile Smasher gets played every once in a while. Uh, Raynor well, the Ever Watchful. We, we can establish the point right here. Yeah. When you built Yarok, did you or did you not already know at least somewhat what to do because you played Colin so much? Oh, yeah. I actually built Yarok uh, to be very different to Tulane. Um, but the overall strategy... Is similar, and because you've played Colin so much, you understood a lot of the lines in that deck, or how they how they functioned at least. Yes, without even yes. ever playing the deck. That's the point yes. I'm trying to make here. Yeah. Yes, I and, and I agree. And I mean, you came to me, and I gave you the deck list, and you went, "I see, you know, two parts of an infinite combo, but not the third. Why?" And I mean, and I went, "Well, because." You know, like I wasn't going for that route. I already have that in two of my other creature combo decks, so I didn't want that one. I just kind of wanted to use it for a one-time value flicker thing, and that that combo is Archaeomancer, Ghostly Flicker, and Parag and Peregrine Drake. But I guess in Yarrick, if you really wanted to, you could sub out the Peregrine Drake for um, uh, Cloud of Fairies uh, if you have Yarrick on the field, or if you don't have Yarrick on the field, just want to make infinite mana to maybe play Yarrick again, you can just do Perrigan Drake, but neither here nor there. Um, I knew a lot of the lines that I was going to be playing in Yarrick because of the the way that I play them in Tulane. Right, and that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make, is that if you play the same strategy over and over, if you build other commanders with similar strategies, you will already have an understanding, at least at a, at least at a basic level, if not more than that, of how that deck functions. Yeah, because I couldn't... Uh, I, I I could roll into a uh, into a spell slinger deck and know exactly what I'm doing every single time unless I have um, familiarity with that deck uh, or that strategy um, because I mean I do have I have one spell slinger deck and I had one a while ago uh, which is Noyan Da and I didn't like it at all and that's not because it was a bad deck it was just I it wasn't really hitting home for me if that makes sense like i, I just it just well it wasn't my strategy uh and i guess with that as we kind of you know fumbled our way through how to explain the last tip uh the last one we have now the last one if that sentence makes any sense to anyone out there uh, and not just me <laughs> um i think this is it may not be like the most important one but it is probably the biggest one paul uh and that's to play within your deck's power range Otherwise, you might not get to understand and appreciate all the nuances of each deck you build. And yeah, I mean, that one just, it's kind of on the nose. But I mean, if you're playing a, a low power deck into a, into like, like if you're playing a pre-con into someone who's playing a focused slash like maybe casually competitive deck, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, it would be like if I brought Feather to a CDH table. Yeah, like <laughs> it's like if I brought Yarrick to, uh, to a CDH table. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, they're, they're massive, massive gaps because, realistically, how can you put a number on power level? And this is another discussion that the commander community has kind of uh, had struggles with and issues with about how to determine power level. Um, but I guess the best way to do it is with the way that we do it, and that's to talk about intentions of your decks. Um, to kind of get like, what is your intention? Do you intend to go off on turn four? Are you intending to go into the late, late game, like turn 15, 16, maybe even 20? Uh, are you, are you intending to, you know, just, uh, turn one win? Maybe, I don't know. That might be a thing that you're into. Um, so kind of get an, and nothing's ever going to be exactly the same. You know what I mean? Like, but kind of get an idea of like where the power levels are at that deck or where your power level is at your deck. And then kind of find similar people to play with around that power level. And I will say it actually, it goes the other way too. It would be like if I brought Marisol to a pod full of people that are playing like only commons in their deck, you know, like I, I'm going to feel like my deck is awesome, but that's not actually true. I'm just, I'm playing with people that don't really have efficient enough answers for the things that I'm trying to do compared to what I'm doing. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's mainly where the issue is going to be is, are you going to run away with the game because you have more sufficient and efficient answers to everything because they don't have those answers? Right, and you know, as self-explanatory as this one sounds, I have... I've done this myself where I've played a deck that was like way too low power in a, in a, in a pod. And I was like, mm-hmm. deck sucks. Like, I don't, I don't want to play it. I think, uh, what was the deck I did that with? It was Rien, I think is the name. It's a Naya Angel. When it deals combat damage, you get like a multicolored card from your graveyard to your hand or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, I think that's. The oh, name she was a buy box promo, wasn't she? Yeah. I, I believe yeah. so. Um, I, I built that deck for a very short time. I played it in my play group and it did awful. I uh I I could not get anything going with it. And so I mm-hmm. actually wound up dismantling that deck. Um but honestly, I think I could have refined that deck. I, I and I should have taken the time to refine that deck. Uh, because it is a cool commander. And actually, if anybody out there has any cool lists for Rian, uh feel free to hit us up with those. Um and honestly, I regret taking that deck apart, and I don't actually know where my Rien is anymore. Um, <laughs> Check your cube; it might be in there. <laughs> it's definitely not in the cube. I can show you that. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you are giving your deck a fair chance. Uh, you know, like if if you're like a high school swimmer and you go up against Michael Phelps, you're gonna feel like you did pretty bad, right? Um, same thing with the, your same thing with your decks. You know, don't don't take your uh, Ramirez, DiPietro, all uncommons and commons deck into a CDH pod, and then feel like, oh, my deck sucks, you know, because you're just you're uh, you're you're not in the right environment for it. Yeah, don't do any of that. I don't have anything else to say about this one. I think you you have just nailed the uh, like the head, hit the nail on the head on that one. Um, yeah, just make sure you're playing around similar power levels. However, you want to determine that. Uh, I've actually had a really good success rate with just handing off, like having my, my, my deck lists on a, an online uh, media. So like Moxfield, we use Architect. Um, and then it's been like, this is my deck list. This is everything my deck wants to do. Is this okay? And people will either go, yes, that looks fine. Or no, you have some cards in there that, that I think are stronger than what you think they are. Or like, you know, like I had that happen with Yarrick, but I mean, that's neither here nor there. Um that's how we uh, that's how we determined the power levels for the Memories Journey stream. We actually had we all had pre-game uh, discussions. We all handed off our deck lists and was like, I want to be playing around this. You know, like this is where I'm comfortable sitting, kind of thing. So I we we linked them, we're like, all right, cool, yep, 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 yep. All right, cool, this is my deck list, I think it's gonna hang. And then we had someone actually come in and kind of evaluate all the decks and be like, all right, cool, if you move this and move that, like this will be fine. And that's the way we were able to get such good uh similar level powers for that stream and i think it was a really really cool fun idea and that's i'm going to be implementing that uh come the future when i play more magic uh in the wild so uh with that we're gonna move to our end step here and if you want to get at us continue this discussion or if you have any tips for us you can do that on twitter and instagram at cmdr at arms uh, don't forget to go check out the YouTube channel where you can check out all of our deck techs and uh, this podcast, as well as our unboxings when we're a- able to get our hands on some uh, some sealed products. Uh, you can do that at Commander at Arms over on YouTube. Don't forget to uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you want to get our TC... Sorry, if you want to get uh, cards delivered to your house while supporting game stores and also buying cards online you can do that through our tcg affiliate link which is tcgplayer.com slash commander at arms if you want to get a commander at arms merch shirt and rock the commander at arms logo across your chest you can do that in the link in the show notes below it will take you to bad Fred designs co which is the host of our shirts and you can check out everything else that she has over there as well uh, if you want to support the show directly, you can do that on patreon.com slash commander at arms. We have three tiers in there. All tiers get you access to the discord server, as well as some little special secret stuff in there as well. And, uh, that kind of, you know, everyone kind of gets to play magic with Paul and I, whenever we're available to do so, um, it's a really cool, cool community to hang out in. And, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully be able to see you guys in there. Uh, Paul, do you have anything you want to say to the listeners? Yes. Uh, first and foremost, 
Thank you all for listening. Even if this is the first and last episode that you ever have or ever will listen to, it means a lot to me and James that you took the time to do so. Uh, time is fleeting. And the fact that you spent maybe even just a couple minutes of it uh, listening to us uh, really is truly endearing to us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, also, please feel free if you enjoyed what you just listened to. Uh, spread our name out. You know, tell your friends, tell your play group. Hey, uh, look, if you notice me getting really good at the game over the next couple of weeks, it's because I listened to episode 74 of the Commander at Arms podcast where they gave me a few tips uh, for really simple things that I can do to start leveling up my gameplay. Um, obviously, you don't have to quote that word for word, but you get my drift. Uh, you know, the more people that we get to spread out to, uh, the better, because one of the best parts about being a part of this community is being able to listen to and take into our own, uh, our own mentality other people's opinions on certain topics. So, honestly, even if you have an opinion about this topic, because I was hesitant to do this because it could be a little controversial, uh, mainly because, obviously, we are not, like I said, pros at this game. But if you have anything else that you'd like to hear about, uh, maybe we can do something similar. Uh, who knows? You know, there's a lot in Magic to talk about, and uh, maybe you've thought of something that we haven't yet. So please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter, YouTube, wherever you're listening. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and just one little quick shout out here. Uh, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, if you go through and give us a five-star rating, it really helps us to bump up to the next, like it kind of like helps the algorithm in there as well. Uh, I'm not sure if any other um, platforms have those kind of systems, but if they do, please hit the rate button Rate us five stars, leave us a review on there as well. Uh, and yeah, just help us get our name out there a little bit more than what we already have. Uh, and with that, I'm James. And I'm Paul. And you've been listening to the newest episode of the Commander at Arms podcast. Peace. See ya.